That's a good word. That can change your life. <laughs> right there. And um, good morning if I haven't greeted you this morning. Um, it's wonderful to have you with us. And you're in the right place at the right time. And uh, something that stirs in my heart while, while you were doing that is it's actually a blessed moment when it feels like we don't have much. Because the value of what we do have increases so much, so much in that moment. So, I mean, you, you might give a hundred rand in a different time, um, but the value of a hundred rand becomes so much more when it feels like there's lack. Anyway, that's just a side note. All the kids, you can join Chanel in the kids' church. Um, they're going to have some fun there. And we are going to start in 2 Corinthians 4. 2 Corinthians 4, verse 17. I really trust the Lord to meet your need today. Um, I've titled this message, The Weight of Glory. Because the fact of the matter is, wherever you are, whatever you're busy with, you are facing some sort of a tough time right now. I know that. Because... That's just being human. It's always going well in some areas, and there's always room for improvement in some others. I know there's not a lot of room for improvement, but it can improve a little. And so being challenged is, and, and feeling like we're suffering is just part of the nature. It's just a human experience. And it doesn't change. Now, I, let me, let's start there in verse 17. I want to encourage you with this this morning. So in 2 Corinthians 4 verse 17, it's written that our light, momentary affliction. Say, I've got a light affliction. I know it doesn't feel that way right now, but my affliction is light. Okay. Say, I've got a momentary affliction. It's a momentary thing. It doesn't feel like it. I know it feels like it's going to last forever at this point in time, but it's temporary. It's a momentary thing. And our light, momentary affliction, this slight distress of the passing hour, and I know it doesn't maybe feel like it's a slight distress at this particular point in time, but it is. It's a small thing, smaller than you think, is ever more and more abundantly preparing and producing and achieving for us an everlasting weight of glory. An everlasting weight of glory. Now, glory is a, it's a strange word, because uh, if we speak about glory, we don't always necessarily understand what we mean by it. Um, we've experienced glory in moments. So if you go and you research the word a little bit, then you're going to find that glory is linked to a feeling of radiance, or even a, 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 an appearance of radiance, like when the angel of the Lord appears and there's light. So everything about you becomes light, it's like you start beaming you start radiating something that's the one thing but it is linked to an increase in the amount of honor that you experience it's linked to an increase in your reputation so when the glory comes then then there's there's a better reputation there's more honor that you experience more honor and so um, there is an expression of a majesty that is godly, of a holiness that is godly, when you experience glory. So when the glory of God comes over us, then all of, the, all of that's part of the package. It's like, immediately, I display Him more majestically. Immediately, I radiate the holiness. Immediately, there, there is a certain level of respect and honor that comes with that. But the biggest thing, about the glory of the Lord is you tap into His immediate presence. All of what He is in His immediate presence. The glory of God. Is that something that you'd want? Is that something that... It's a, that's definitely something that I want on my life. And um, I can tell you this, the moment that you, that you taste it, you're spoiled for the world. All right, but the glory of God. And now the thing is, our slight, our momentary... Light affliction, the slight distress of the passing hour, is producing for us 
an everlasting weight of glory. I want to ask you a question in this. If today, if today I promise you that for 13 years of your life, things are going to be tough. For 13 years, for say the next 13 years, things are going to be tough. You're going to be placed in situations where you don't want to be. People are going to disappoint you. They will not pitch up when they're supposed to be pitched up. Promises will be made and broken. All right? And um, the system is going to be broken. The system's not going to aid you. But if you can stick it out and be faithful in those 13 years, then 13 years from now, you're going to break through. Would you take that? Are you willing? All right. I just want to put a little bit of perspective on this. You're going to see where I'm going with this right now. The fact of the matter is, your light momentary affliction is producing an everlasting, everlasting weight of glory. An everlasting, closer to God, being a better expression of who He is in your life. If we experience His glory, we just look like Him. We do like Him. Right, and then since we consider and we look not to the things that are seen, but to the things that are unseen. For the things that are visible and temporal brief, are brief and fleeting. But the things that are invisible are deathless and everlasting. What we need to do is we need to develop a, a, a mindset and an attitude of looking to the things that are everlasting. Not the things that are temporal. The temporal things are just producing the things that are everlasting. The temporal things are just producing the things that are everlasting. We, no, we don't look to the seen, we look to the unseen. Because it's in the unseen that the real action is happening. Now, let's turn to Romans 5. Romans 5 says the following. So therefore, since we are justified, acquitted, declared righteous, and given a right standing with God. That's quite a package. He acquits me of my sin. He declares me righteous. He declares me righteous. He says that we are now in right standing with, him, with one another. And because he says that I don't have to question it. But we are acquitted. We are declared righteous. And we are given a right standing with God. That's quite a gift. Because now I'm always in the right relationship with Him. Because I am now always in the right relationship with Him. There's no reason for me to not have access to Him. And because I'm in the right relationship with Him, it also means that no momentary affliction can derail my destiny. That's good news. That's good news. It means... You can't miss it anymore. You can never miss it. Never ever can you miss God's plan with your life. We are just not that powerful. But we've been given right standing with Him through faith. So since we have been given this right standing with God through faith, let us grasp the fact that we have the peace of reconciliation to hold and enjoy. And to enjoy the peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, the Messiah, the Anointed One. When things go tough in our lives, the first thing that tends to happen is for the peace to go. But if we remind ourselves of the fact that our relationship with God is our stability, through His faith, I am acquitted, I'm given the right standing, that gives you the base to launch from. Peace returns, the moment that the peace returns, we can breathe and we can assess the situation, and we can say, okay, right, then I can start looking away from the seen, look into the unseen, where the eternal things are starting to happen. And now, through Him, and this is one of those verses that has just grabbed hold of my heart in recent times here, but through Him, we also have our access, our entrance and our introduction by faith into this grace which is the state of God's favor. Because you believe in Him, because I believe in Him, 
we have been given the keys to access the grace. The grace is our inheritance. Grace is in front of us, and grace is God's favor. That means that regardless of the situation that I'm facing right here, right now, regardless of the challenges and how some of them can feel that they are really beyond me, regardless of all that, I've got access to His grace. His favor is on my life. We heard it earlier when Chanel was talking about Joseph. Where Joseph went, God was with him. It's even testified of him in the New Testament when Stephen is, is getting up and giving that, uh, that speech before they stone him. But God was with Joseph. Now, here's the thing. Do you think Joseph thought that God was with him? We're going to explore that in a, in a bit. I think he knows, but I think he had some questions. I think he knew, but he had some questions. Now, but there we go. We've got access by faith into this grace, this state of God's favor, in which we firmly and safely stand. So I stand in grace. You stand in grace. That's where we stand. Nowhere else. If I plant my feet on grace... I stand firmly. That's what he died for. So I access his favor. But his favor is going to ensure that I get where I'm going. And that what his plan is on my life is not going to get derailed. Now, and let us rejoice and exult in our hope of experiencing and enjoying the glory of God. So this is where Paul starts this little bit. He says, we can have peace because we're in faith. Because we're in faith, we've, we have God's favor. We've got access to the grace. And because of all that, we can have joy. So that is what we protect. We protect that in our minds. Understanding that we are, I've, I've got the right to favor. It's my, it's my inheritance. Because I've got the right to favor, I will enjoy the glory of God. Now, moreover, verse 3, let us also be full of joy now. Let us exult and triumph in our troubles. <laughs> exult and triumph in our troubles. Triumph in our troubles. It's like, you know how bad it goes with me at this point in time. It goes so bad of, with me at this point in time that I can be excited about it. And I can start exulting about it because my light momentary affliction is creating for me an everlasting weight of glory. Now, how heavy is my circumstance? How heavy are my circumstances at this point in time? Are they pretty heavy? Well, the weight of glory is everlasting and surpassing. The tougher you are having it at this point in time, the more the glory the more you're going to tap into who God really is, the more that's going to surface, come out. So we can be joyful about that. So let us exult. Let us triumph in our troubles and rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that pressure and affliction and hardship produce patient and unswerving endurance. That means I'm going to have to keep going. I'm going to patiently have to Put the one foot in front of the other, and I'm going to have to go. I'm going to have to keep going. I'll have to endure. But the pressure will result in me keeping on, keeping on. And when the pressure does result in me keeping on, keeping on, it will produce the endurance. And the endurance develops maturity of character which here is described as approved faith and tried integrity. If you go to the, origin, to the origin of the word character, it actually literally means that you take, take something and you taste it, and then you in, engrave it. So it's pretty much like the gold bars that I had there at the start, where you taste the gold, say, okay, well, this gold is, is of a fineness of 999. That means it's 999 parts out of 1,000 is gold. It's solid. It's pure gold. So it's the equivalent of a 24 carat, um, 24 carat gold. All parts of it is gold. And then you engrave it. Now that only comes by tasting. 
even in our lives. It only comes by testing. So circumstances are going to test you. What we think is that the test is there to break me. And that's a wrong thinking. The test is there to promote you. The test is there to reveal to you how far you have come. That's what a test does. We understand it maybe a little bit better when we think about it in the I say school sense of, of the word. When you're writing an, an exam. When you pass the exam, you promote. Why? Because the exam proves how far you've come. It's not about the exam. It's about what happened before the exam. The exam just reveals it, right? And the character of this sort produces the habit of joyful and confident hope of eternal salvation. So that joyful and confident hope is a, is a quiet, it's a, it's a character, it's a heart that's trusting and confident. It says, you know what, doesn't matter what's going to come, what's, ha what's going to happen, I know everything is going to be okay because I know that God is in control. You can go research that, I haven't got time for, for, for uh, developing that idea a little bit. But, verse 5, such hope never disappoints. So I won't be disappointed. I won't be disappointed. I've got troubles, I've got afflictions, I've got sufferings. But I won't be disappointed. No. It's producing for me an everlasting weight of glory. And now, such hope never disappoints or deludes or shames us. For God's love has been poured out in our hearts through the Holy Spirit, who has been given to us. Now, I did not know that Chanel was going to talk about Joseph this morning. I asked you a little bit earlier, if I promised you that it's going to be a 13-year difficult period, would you take it? That's what happened in the life of Joseph. He's 17 years old when we read about him, when we read that his father's favoring him. Here's an interesting thing. In that moment, we read that he brought his father a bad report of his brothers. That was something that I missed for quite a, quite a long time. I mean, I always thought that he was really a victim of their jealousy, and, but he brought a bad report. So some of the, the difficulties that he went through was of his own making, as it sometimes is in our lives. Sometimes we, are, we had a definite contribution to the calamities that we face. But yes, there's that part, and then there's Joseph favoring him, understandably, all right? Because that comes from, oh, now I said Joseph, I meant Jacob. Jacob, his father, is favoring him, but he's favoring him from a position of his own pain, if you think about it. Because, yes, he had two wives, he had two concubines, but he really only wanted one. His heart was really sold out to Rachel, if you think about it. And Joseph, in that sense, is the first, is, is his firstborn. Because that's the firstborn son with the wife that he actually wanted. So, ach, now I'm saying Joseph, I'm saying Joseph is the firstborn, but it's Jacob's, Jacob's boy. So Jacob's still dealing with his pain. All right? But in that, he is favored. He gets this tunic with the, with the colors, and he is not with his brothers when they are looking after the, looking after the, the sheep. All right, and we know what happens there. Joseph is sent, and Joseph lands in the pit because of his obedience. Now, earlier Chanel said that obedience is key, <laughs> key to prosperity. <laughs> All right, that doesn't mean that when you're obedient, it's going to look prosperous immediately. Okay, because Joseph's obedience landed him up in a pit. All right? And in this jealousy, in this, ultimately, the brothers didn't kill him because they said, what can we gain from killing him? So they sold him for 20 silver silver coins, and then that's the way he ends up in, in Egypt. And that's when we pick it up there in Potiphar's house. But the thing is, he's in Potiphar's house, and the Bible says that God was with him. God was with him. Of course, what he's doing in that moment is, well, what's living in his heart while he's there? I've lost my freedom. I've lost my family. I've been rejected. I'm hated. 
And he's also hated, by the way, because of the destiny on his life. He had the dreams. He told his family about the dreams. Now, who can you tell about the dreams if it's not the people closest to you? I mean, I don't think it's unreasonable for him to share it with his family. I don't think it's unreasonable for us in a setting like this to share dreams with one another. So who can you tell if not the people closest to you? But the people closest to him reacted in a very contrary way to what he expected. And that made, him, that made them hate him even more, which contributes to him being here. Now that's, so he's in Egypt and he's saying, okay, well, this is, this is the way it is. The emotions that he's going through must have been crazy. But what he does is he puts his head down and he, he serves. All right, and we know what happens there. He, he serves so well that he becomes basically second in charge. That's what happened. Everywhere where Joseph came, he became second in charge. That was the theme of his life. And then, when things are going fairly well, because he's really running that household, he's got all the power, what happens? Somebody sees what's on his life and wants in. So Potiphar's wife gets so mesmerized with this success on his life, with this favor of God on his life, that she just, she just wants in. And we know that she lies about him, and he ends up in jail. Now he's in prison. Now, what do you think the emotions are that he's going through in this hardship, in this affliction? For crying in a bucket. Is it not enough that I'm a slave? Is it not enough that I'm, I've been taken away from my family? And have I not served God? Have I not? But he did. And he served him wholeheartedly. And things get worse. They don't get better. More of his freedom gets taken away. Now he's a prisoner. And he needs to serve other prisoners. But what happens? He's faithful. And while he's faithful, he's working his way up the chain again. Until he's second in command. Doesn't take very long. And then there comes a moment in which the chief butler and the chief baker end up in jail because they riled up the pharaoh the wrong way and they they dream and so here for the first time we see that joseph um, starts operating from his spiritual gifting where before it was actually in the natural it was his talents that he was operating on his he was a natural leader he had natural management skills but now he's operating from his spiritual gift as well and wh while he's operating from the spiritual gift um, he, they have the dreams, he tells, he tells them what the dreams mean, and I want to pick it up there, verse 14, it's verse 14, but think of me, so he just laid out the butler's dream, said you will be restored in your position, and when he's restored in his position, he says, but think of me, Joseph saying, think of me, think of me, when it shall be well with you, and show kindness, I beg of you to me. You the me, myself, and I there. Joseph saying, hey, think of me. Joseph is saying, think of me, because Joseph was thinking of himself as well in that time. Um, I'll show you just, just now. So I beg of me and mention me to the Pharaoh and get me out of this house. Get me out of this house. We see a, a little bit of what Joseph's going through here. Verse 15. For I truly was carried away from the land of the Hebrews by unlawful force. That's his experience. And I think a pretty fair one, if I think about it. A pretty fair one. I've been carried away from the land of the Hebrews by unlawful force, and here too I have done nothing for which they should put me in the dungeon. I relate to that. I really do. If I look at the tale on his life, I can say, I get that. Not so? But the thing is, this is Joseph's perspective at that point in time. Now remember, what's he going through? He's going through the sufferings. He's going through the troubles. What does the suffering and the trouble do? It creates perseverance. Perseverance and endurance. Keeping on, keeping on. And so this is what Joseph is doing well in this point in time. He is keeping on, keeping on. Working himself up to second in command in Potiphar's house. Then working himself up into second in command in the prison, 
He is keeping on, keeping on. The per perseverance, the endurance is, is, uh, is creating that godly character. And I'm going to show you what the godly character is. I'm also going to show you that once the godly character came, the breakthrough came. Because shortly after, now we know what happens here, and it, it had to happen in these two years in between. Because there were two full years that, that passed from the moment that he, uh, he, lay, he interprets the dreams of, of the chief butler and the chief baker to the time that Pharaoh has his dreams. And now there's a crisis. And see, God is preparing you for a crisis. God prepares his children for the crisis moment. So that when we are in the crisis moment, we can bring the solution to the crisis. It's part of being in his grace. It's part of tapping into his favor. And uh, that's what happens with Joseph. So the crisis moment is there. Nobody can solve the problem. The chief butler says, wait a minute, I know a guy. And, he, and they let Joseph come. Now when Joseph is facing the Pharaoh, the amazing thing is he himself doesn't do what he asked the chief butler to do. So he asked the chief butler to mention him to Pharaoh, to plead his case, to get him out of there. But what Joseph did is he came and he interpreted the dream. Then after he interprets the dream... Um, so he says, it's not me. First up, he says, understand that I'm not here in my own strength. I stand here in the strength of God. And then it's his spiritual gifting in that crisis moment that brings the breakthrough. When that happens, Pharaoh asks, well, where will we find somebody to, how will we solve this problem that we know is coming? How will we, how will we know this? And Joseph said, well, you've got to, Appoint a wise man, a discreet man who can think on his feet and can prepare so long. And, um, but he's not recommending himself in that moment. He's not recommending himself in that moment. And then Pharaoh says, okay, but why don't I appoint you? I mean, God has made this known to you. Clearly, you're the man for the job. And then he does. And we know that Joseph becomes second in command in Egypt. So he just he just keeps on keeping on. But now what we see is in this keeping on, character has been produced. So see, he's, going, he's about to, to start experiencing this weight of glory this, that has been produced by this whole process. And so um, he gets a wife and he has sons. Genesis 41, 51. Again, I want to put you in Joseph's shoes. See what his perspective was. See, when, when he, uh, Joseph called the firstborn Manasseh, making to forget. For God, said he, has made me forget all my toil and my hardship and all my father's house. Interesting, because when we read of him in Potiphar's house, it says God was with him and he had favor on his life. And when we read about him in prison, it says God was with him and he had favor on his, on his life. So that was the reality of it. God was with him. Regardless of the circumstances, regardless of the suffering, regardless of this apparent calamity in front of you, God was with him. But his experience was that he had to forget his toil, his hardship in his father's house. And his father's house. In other words, what happened with him through his father. Uh, well, and through his family. So he's saying, finally... I've been restored to a position where I can forget about all of that. That's the one thing. And then he, and the second, he called Ephraim to be fruitful. For he said that God has caused me to be fruitful in the land of my affliction. So we very much know that Joseph's experience was one of suffering and trouble and affliction. But it was light and it was momentary. By the time he got, he was 30 years old when he was positioned as the second in charge in Egypt. And if we look at it from Joseph's perspective, we'll say that's the end of the story. Because if we look at it, if we place ourselves in Joseph's shoes, we'll say, there's the breakthrough. That's what it was all about. Now he's made it. Now he's successful. But that's not what it's all about. All of this 
was preparation for the true moment that was about to come. Because the thing is, in this famine, his family was sent to come and, and buy grain. And in the bigger picture, if we step away from a human perspective and we look at God's perspective, what was God saying about the plan on Joseph's life? What was God saying? Because the destiny on Joseph's life was to position the Israelites in Egypt according to the word of the Lord. Already to Abraham, God made known that his his people, his descendants, would be strangers in a different land. And that he will bring them back. So the prophecy was there. God was fulfilling his word in the process. And that had to happen some way. So Joseph is sent. And that's, that's his own words. When he reunites with his family, you can see that in that moment... Certain anchors fire. He's, he's starting to, uh, well, first, he, he speaks to them sternly. I can only imagine, because you don't expect to see these people in front of you here now. I mean, you've not seen them for 13 plus years. It's just, you get used to not seeing them. And then one day, poof, yeah, your brothers are showing up. Those same oaks who started all of this. And we can see how he... I can see how he, he kicks into human nature there because it's, it's written in the Bible that he thought about his dreams that he had, that they're where they come and they bow before him, and then he starts speaking to them harshly. It's like, I mean, it's human. It's, it's, it's going to be the way. And so he speaks to them harshly, and, um, and he even throws them into jail. He jailed them for three days, saying, okay, you'll send... One of you go back and then go fetch your younger brother so that I can see. And the interesting thing in that is when he comes back, Genesis 42 verse 17. So then he put them all in custody for three days. And Joseph said to them on the third day, Joseph said to them on the third day, do this and live. I reverence and fear God. So if you are true men, let one of your brothers be bound in your, in your prison, but the rest of you go and carry grain for those weakened with hunger in your households. I hear that God spoke to him in those three days. Right. Because there's no reason to jail them for three days. Right. That was from a human point perspective. He jailed them because he was getting back at them. And God spoke with him. That's why he says, I reverence and I fear God. I shouldn't keep you guys here. But the fact of the matter is he wanted to. This is the true test. This is, this is that moment in which, the, which he was prepared for, through the hardship, through the calamity, so that he can understand why are these people in front of me now. And so we know, we know that they, he sends them away, and then they come back with Benjamin. And by the time that he reveals himself to them, they understandably are very, very afraid of this. But his words to them in that moment, when they come back, so when he reveals himself to his, to his brothers, he says, Come near to me, I pray you, and they did so. And then he said, I am Joseph, your brother, whom you sold in Egypt. But now, do not be distressed and disheartened or vexed and angry with yourselves because you sold me. For God sent me ahead of you to preserve life. Earlier, I'm here unlawfully. I've been stolen. I've been wronged. Me, 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 me. Now, after the development of his character in the hardship, he's, he's the weight of glory is there. His understanding. Wait a minute. There was a bigger picture to this all the time. And the bigger picture was that I am sent ahead. God sent me ahead of you to preserve life. And he invites his people in. And so they settle. They settle in the best part of Egypt during the worst famine. And Joseph, being positioned where he is, is 
laying up the wealth of the known world in Egypt in that point. So all of the all the people came and, and bought bought food there. You can see, you can go read. Once the um, the money dried up, they 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 brought their livestock, and when the livestock uh, was depleted, they sold their land, and all of that wealth was was locked up in Egypt. And four hundred years later. When the Israelites were leaving Egypt, they demanded treasures from the Egyptians as they left. So Joseph is gathering the wealth that left with Moses. That's the bigger picture. The bigger picture is all of us gathering. The God, God's hand was there positioning. That's, that's the godly perspective. Now, knowing that, Joseph understood there's a weight of glory to this. There's also a weight of glory waiting for your suffering, whatever that suffering is today. I know there's a variety of ways in which you landed where you are. Sometimes it's our mistakes. Sometimes it's people's empty promises. Sometimes it's because of jealousy. Sometimes it's because of greed, like Potiphar's wife, whatever the circumstances. Whatever has landed you in the position that you are in. Whatever, know that it's not out of, outside of God's plan for your life. His plan has taken into account that. And our light momentary affliction is producing for us an everlasting and a more abundant weight of glory. Our job is to stick it out. Our job is to stick it out. It's amazing, in the moment before Joseph meets the Pharaoh, it's still me, myself, and I. After he meets the Pharaoh, and he, he testifies to his brothers, he says, God sent me ahead. So where did the change of heart come? I think it was while he was in prison, immediately before the breakthrough. That's where you and I can hang around. May it bless you. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much that we can know that your sovereignty and the fact that you know everything has taken into account human error, has taken into account flaws that we might have, and has paved the way for us to be successful in your dream, in your vision, regardless of regardless of the way we treat people, regardless of the way people treat us, regardless of the curveballs that life throw our way, regardless of the toil and the hardships, the sufferings, the afflictions. I pray, Lord, that you touch our hearts this morning and so that each and every one of us will know that the harder the suffering, the more the glory. Thank you, Lord, that as we persevere, as our character is tried and tested and purified, as this hope wells up in us, we know that we know that we know the end result of this is to know you better, to experience you more, to co-labor with you better, and to, and to just enjoy who you are through us in our lives. Thank you that there is a bigger picture. And that we can look to the unseen and not to the seen. Because the, the seen things are temporal, but the unseen are eternal. I pray that and release that over everybody hearing my voice right now. In the name of Jesus. Amen.